I've been told to um, to uh, speak about how I became me. I was made I was made in Morocco, um, and I arrived in 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 um, Huddersfield when I was uh, four. This is where this is me, age 16, in the pottery department. My only qualification for doing design actually is an A level in ceramics. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm growing up at a time when punk music is is. Uh, uh, what was happening at, at school. I was never a punk, but it teaches a whole generation um, to be free of the constraints of having um, to learn your craft. My passion was really for also music and motorcycles, but my passion for cars and motorcycles remained, and that's when I learned how to weld. So welding is, is excellent as a method of being um, very fast at making things. So it becomes my superpower, and through welding I'm able to make structures really quickly and um, without too much planning. I think if you're a woodworker or even a potter, you have to plan things, you have to fire them or you have to glue them, you have to wait for the glue to dry. But if you're a welder, you can make things and you can cut them up and you can remake them. So it suited my impatience. This is my first few pieces. So here we see some furniture which is rusty, it's dangerous, it's ugly, but it's got a very personal attitude. And it's really through practice that I became a designer. This chair is still one from a, a, a scrap moment, and you can see here <coughs> the, the steering wheel of a Golf, a Volkswagen Golf GTI, and the inner tube from the same car used as upholstery. But I get spotted by the Italian um, luxury companies, and it gives me a, a, a more um, global reputation, if you like, because they've got global distribution. And this chair ends up in the Museum of Modern Art. I'm lucky to have my first job uh, in Habitat, which was at the time 70 stores around Europe, but it was owned by IKEA, which meant that I leapt from being a self-taught designer to working for the biggest furniture company in the world. So that was really my university for doing stuff. And um, at, Ikea, at, at the Habitat, really, I learned much more about um, branding and uh, marketing and catalogues and the cost of um, containers coming in from China and more importantly what people really buy rather than what you think they buy. So that's how I became me. Uh, I picked on a model which is more familiar to the fashion industry than to the product design industry because most fashion designers are happy to stick their name above the shop and to put it in the label and they do their own production and they their own design and their own communication as well and often have their own shops. But in product design it's kind of quite unusual and the reason for that is because it's actually quite difficult. So this is, for instance, the reason. So this is Vitra, which you'll probably know is an amazing company for uh, making mainly office furniture, but also has the rights to the Eames collection and a, a load of modern classics, if you like. And this is a selection of, of goods outside their factory. And this is the situation for the designers. So here we see the designers. And if I was ever to design or be asked to design for Vitra, I'd be joining this amazing, illustrious crew of designers but I'll also be fighting against the geniuses of the 20th century. As a designer, it becomes very hard to have your own identity and your own aesthetic and your own point of view. So I decided not to do that and to do this. So I'm super lucky to have a snappy name, and that becomes quite easy to brand, and you'll see it stuck on everything from the shop front and to the, the candles down at the back. Whereas here, you'll see things which are made from brass and glass, um, from concrete and wood. You'll, you'll find things that are in different size boxes, you know, from a big chair or a huge table to a tiny candle. And so from a logistics point of view, it's a nightmare. From a manufacturing point of view, it's really complicated. Um, so we do a lot of lighting. You'll see us doing these contemporary chandeliers that are clusters of lights. Um, we play a lot with um, uh, lighting effects. And we do also furniture. Um, which I think are trying to do things which have a sculptural impact on a room. Um, so I've had many adventures in tabletop, in flower arranging, um, in uh, glassware, different techniques and technologies, even to the point of doing, being a perfumier now as well. So I've gone all the way from being a potter to perfumier, and it's not finished yet. So if you go to the end of the shop, you'll find a, a, a pure perfumery. Um, and uh, if you go to the bathroom, you'll be able to rub Tom Dixon all over yourself um, <laughs> with my very affordable soap. And, and you could even take home a dishwashing liquid, and this really is the, the um, secret of my, how I will eventually make my fortune as a dishwashing magnate. And so obviously you've seen a lot of people doing merchandise for uh, the Royal Wedding and taking advantage of it. And we were quite interested maybe a week before the Royal Wedding because we suddenly got some phone calls from ITV saying, we've seen Megan's flat in Toronto six years ago and she's got your candles on the side of her bedroom table. You can see here, 
our diffuser. <laughs> What's kind of interesting, if you zoom into this picture and you have a look at the, at the soaps and, and, and the different things, is that actually this range is called royalty, right? So even <laughs> before she met Prince, Prince Harry, she was able to access royalty through Tom Dixon, <laughs> and you can do the same here in the shop place. 